Let me read the scripture for you. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this day. And I praise you, Father, that we can be together in your house to worship and to praise you. Lord, that we can rejoice in the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. And I pray today, dear Father, that you would speak to our hearts what we need to hear. Lord, that each one of us would be receptive to the voice of your Holy Spirit to speak to us, Lord. I pray, Father, that my words would not prevail. I pray, Father, hide the speaker behind the cross. Have your will in Jesus' name. Amen. When I read this, the first thing that dawns out there, jumps out, of course, is the, is the chorus that we sing. I love it when we, when we make choruses out of verses, and then one day you read the verse and you go, Oh, that's where that's at. So that's why I wanted to pull you back into this one in Psalms 84. Um, Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. You know, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Uh, that meaning, you know, I'm going to be a doorkeeper. I'm just going to sit at the door. I don't even get to go inside. I'm just going to be the doorkeeper there. It's better than dwelling in the house of the wicked. It's better than being in the tents. It's better than being inside. I would rather be on the, on the outside, just at the edge of God's house, than to, to, to have the very best that the world has to offer. And I think that that's a, a reality that most of us are, are aware of, is that God's worst is better than the world's best. You can, you can have everything that this world has to offer and you still have nothing. We see this modeled time and time again in our society. When we see people that we think have accomplished everything. I was on the internet the other day and I saw that Bruce Willis has one of his mansions for sale. Actually, he's selling three of them. But the only one that had any relevance to me was the one in Haley. You know, and he had, he had dropped the price um, from 13 million to, no, from 15 million to 13 million. I know. And, and I thought, when it gets to 11, yeah. That's one of his houses. That was probably the cheaper of the ones that he was selling. He was also selling his Beverly Hills mansion as well as his New York uh, uh, mansion. And I thought, yeah, I couldn't afford those ones probably. The, the Haley one, yeah. I don't know, maybe a couple of us could go in together on that. I'm, I'm thinking that the payments on that will probably come out around $11,000 a month. So maybe three of us would want to go together on that. I don't know. But, uh, you know, the funny thing is, is, uh, you know, people can have that much money and be that unhappy, you know, that, that we can watch people in our society to who accomplish what we think is... They're, 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 you think of our movie stars. Men, they are blessed. They live a charmed life. People throw money at them. They're popular like nobody's business and miserable in all their popularity and wealth. Why? 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 You know, I mean, uh, I, we were watching The Christmas Carol and uh, uh, Scrooge talks to his... It's the Muppet one. That's our favorite. As, as uh, uh, Scrooge is talking to his nephew and he says... Uh, uh, he says, you're poor enough, why are you happy? And he says, you're rich enough, why are you miserable? You know, um, and I think that, well, why? Why are people, why can people accomplish so much, attain, after years and years of struggle, attain everything that they are looking to get and then still be miserable in it? You know why? It's an easy answer. It's because you can't get enough of something you don't want. You know, when you're looking to fill a hole and you're filling it with the wrong thing, it doesn't matter how much you put in there. You know, we're called for fellowship with God and we're looking for peace and we're looking for joy. We're looking for contentment. And those things are not found in the world. So you can grab as much money as you want to and it's not going to fill that peace hole. I'm not going to have peace and I'm not going to have contentment by acquiring more wealth. As a matter of fact, the ironic thing about the scripture, it says, is that the poor man sleeps well, whether he eats little or much, but the rich man can't sleep for his wealth. You know, when you have more, you're worried about losing it. The guy who doesn't have anything, well, he's not too, too super worried about losing it. Uh, you know, I remember as a kid growing up, we, uh, we never locked our doors. Um, we never locked the back door in particular because it didn't have a door handle on it. We just had a rope through it where you would pull the door open and shut. 
You know, um, it didn't, you know, we just had a, it was just a, where the hole where the lock would go. We just had a piece of rope through there with a knot tied on either side. So when you'd open the door, you would pull that and it would open it. When you wanted to close it, you would pull it and close it. You know, and no one ever broke into our house. <laughs> and we were never worried about anybody breaking into the house. It was never a concern for us. You know, but once you acquire enough, you get wealth, you start locking the doors, putting on your security alarms. They don't have burglar alarms, but we have security alarms to protect all your stuff. And we become actually, the ironic thing is, we, we really should have insecurity alarms. You know, um, because we're, we're, we're doing these things because we become insecure. You know, the world just doesn't have a lot to offer. It just doesn't have a lot to offer. And you can try and try and struggle to get, to get the best the world has. And it still won't be... Enough. I heard a fellow talking about this once, and I, I, I'm going to steal his illustration. He had a son. I had daughters. But uh, he had, his boys liked cereal. His, his kid liked cereal. I don't know if you ever have a kid that likes cereal. But when they like cereal, there's, there's always a kind of cereal that they like, too. They never say, hey, Dad, I would like some granola. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. It's, it's, Dad, can I have some chocolate chocolate cocoa puffs you know i mean that's you know i mean it's that's, it's not it's not the stuff that's ever any good for you you know so they want the they want if it's got anything in it besides sugar it's a waste of time you know i mean really you go i want some cereal you go you don't want cereal here here's a bowl of sugar some milk and a spoon you know <laughs> you have at it you know i mean so he the kid said you know hey dad can i have some cereal you know and kids always ask dad too they don't ask mom you know mom would say no moms are more health conscientious dads are more Relational, we go here. Yes, sweetheart. Here's some. Here's your spoon. You know, that's the dad's role in life. That's what we do. That's what we're marked for. So, dad, can I have some cereal? Everybody else is eating their steak and potatoes or whatever they're eating for dinner. And he says, "Sure, you can have some cereal." Gives the kids some cereal. You know, and uh, the kid sits down, eats cereal. The, the rest of the family eats whatever they're eating. Then, you know, they decide to go to bed a little bit later. You know, they eat say at six o'clock. They go to bed at eight or nine. Everybody goes to bed. Except one little fella comes knocking on the door. Dad, I'm hungry. Can I have some cereal? <laughs> See, we tried that already, you know, but... All right, yeah, I go. Here's some more cereal. Eat your cereal. So the kid scarfs down another bowl of cereal, you know. First thing in the morning, you know, everybody else is just starting to grog up. Dad, can I have some cereal? You see, I'm going to tell you a secret about cereal. It, it, this sugary kind of stuff, it's really not that filling. You know, it, it, it doesn't sustain you. And you find yourself hungry very quickly when you're trying to be sustained on something of that nature. Is, is there, I don't know if there's any kind of a parallel there scripturally or spiritually. I, I, when, we're, when, we're trying to fill up, when we're trying to fill up on what this world has to offer and we are hungry for the things of God, you will not be filled by this world. You'll find yourself hungry over and over again, constantly in a state of famine where you're miserable, discontent, and you're looking for something more. And the more you look in this world, the less you find it, the less content you'll ever become. Why? Because God's worst is better than this world's best. It's better. We, we went up and visited a friend who, uh, uh, last week, I wasn't here for the funeral. We were, we were doing a funeral up in Colville, and it was a, a friend of ours who came to the church here, Dave Rarick. Um, his, his, his wife, uh, his second wife, had passed away. And uh, um, uh, we went up there to do her, her service. And when I was visiting with Dave, and he said, you know, uh, uh, should have been the worst time of my life. Should have been the worst thing possible. But I just knew that the Lord was with us. And it was all okay. And so his wife, who was 45 years old when she died, uh, after a 12-year struggle with cancer, he said, you know, this was some of the best times just the best times, even in the midst of these hard times. And that's how it is with God. That's how it is with the Lord. You can, you can, you're going to have hard times, folks. You're going to have them. You can go through them alone or you go through them with God. When we're with Him, when we're with Him, even the bad times can be good times. Even the worst losses, even the most difficult things you can go through, you can still say, you know what? I can recognize that the Lord's hand was with me and I can see where I've grown through this difficult task. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. The ironic thing is, is that in comparison to the time of our lives here on earth versus what we look forward to in eternity, we are not trading one day in God's house with a thousand days here in the house of the wicked. 
Do you follow that? We are not abiding in the house of the wicked right now for one day to be in God's presence. We have got one day or one minute or one second compared to eternity in God's presence. Our lives are just a little blip. If we were to draw a line of eternity and it were to go from one wall to the other, your lifetime, my lifetime, would barely be recognizable on the scale. You, it would be so minute, so small. What we have at stake to lose here below by compromising, by not doing all of the things that the world has to offer. You've got so little to lose and so much at stake to gain. We're going to spend eternity with God. It's not better as one day in your house than a thousand elsewhere. It's better as a thousand days in your house than one day elsewhere. You know, the church gets this mixed up. Jesus says, I'm going to leave the 99 sheep and go find the one that's lost. Sometimes we have a tendency to hang on to the one sheep and not worry about the 99 that are lost. It's not that we got one day and exchanging it for for. For a thousand days of evil, you can do your one day of evil and you'll lose a thousand days in God's presence. We've got a lot to look forward to. This world is passing by. It's just for a little while. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. That blameless part is a little bit tricky. You know, to be blameless to be faultless, to find yourself in a place where you are, you are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ and in His fellowship. Some people, though, I think that we have a hard time because we don't really... Some people don't serve God. They serve Santa. You know, they get them mixed up. You know, they, they get confused on that. And when things don't go the way that they want to, they're out of fellowship with the Lord because they're in a position where they can't be blessed by God. And then they're, then they're confused. They think, Lord, why aren't you giving me everything that I'm asking for? God says, because I'm not Santa. Uh, I mean, that's the, the, the short answer. But sometimes we're just in a position emotionally where we're not able to, be, we are not blameless. We have to be blameless. When you already know that you're guilty, when you're walking around with a guilty conscience, when you have damaged your relationship with the Lord, you don't want to be in His presence. It's really hard for you to find His blessings. When you are walking in disobedience, you will not find God's blessings. It's not that they're not there. It's just you can't find them. And I, I use this illustration because Brianna's with me today. Um, but my girls are both here, so it was kind of fun. Um, when we, we, we took them to the prison yesterday. And so that was where I, uh, uh, it's a rite of passage at my house. When you turn 18, you go to prison. <laughs> it's our version of scared straight. So um, I took them over there with me because Danielle just turned 18 this week, and so she got to go to prison for the first time. How exciting, huh? Yeah, now you guys are jealous. All right, you can talk to me. I used the illustration there. When Danielle was real little, she was, uh, oh, she was maybe crawling. She was maybe one, you know. I mean, she was, she was real little. So Brianna is about three years older than her, so she was about four. And um, I came home from somewhere. I don't know where I was at. I, um, I been out doing something holy and uh i came home and uh i was met at the door by my wife and all you guys know nancy oh lord have mercy there is never a more peaceful person on the face of the planet i have never met anybody i think really and i and i this is just the truth i've never seen anybody that i think reflects jesus christ any better than my wife you guys are so lucky to have her i mean seriously you know you put up with me i might be worth it or not you got my wife that's a, that is like, I'm not, you know, that's worth it in itself. She's amazing. But I come in from uh, being out doing the work of the Lord, and I come walking in the door, and I am met by my wife, my rabid wife, which I, have no, I do not encounter very often. I mean, it is like, she's frothing at the mouth, you know. It's, 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 and I'm like, holy cow, what is this, you know. I mean, I, I, I don't see this very often, you know. And she's just like, she is just, just on spin cycle. She's so angry. And I'm like, wow, you know, I, I called a Catholic priest. It's time for an exorcism. I, I, I don't know what to do here. This is, you know, and I, I, what, what's wrong? What's the matter? What's the matter? And she says, well, Brianna was playing. And Danielle, they were in the other room. I walk in. Brianna has an ink pen. 
and she stabbed her sister in the head with it. And I said, you know, all oh, the sibling rivalry is so cute. I said, okay. And she said, so I took the pen away from her. I said, all right. She goes, and I put her in her bed. I said, you know, so far, so good. You know, Brianna was always a socialite. We would discipline them so differently. You know, um, uh, we would, you know, when, Dan when Brianna did something wrong, I would spank her, swap. But when she did something really bad, we would isolate her. You know, it's like put her in a timeout was like so much worse to her than a spanking. It was like, just beat me. You know, it's like, you know. But for Danielle, we put her in a timeout. Nancy walked in one time. She'd put her in a timeout. She's about five. She goes in. She says, okay, you come out of your timeout now. Danielle has a sock on either hand, and they're talking. <laughs> and Danielle says, can I have five more minutes? <laughs> we found out that timeouts were not as effective with Danielle as they were with Brianna. I, I always think about these guys who claim to be experts on raising kids. And I go, how can you be an expert? They're all individually different. You know, I'm an expert now, but only on these two. You know, you know your kids, you're on your own. I got no clues. I don't have any idea what to do with them. I don't know why we have them. It's uh, temporary insanity. But anyway, she's, she says, I put Brianna in there in her, on her bed. I said, okay. She says, and then I walked in. Because Nancy was so amazing at giving our girls a little bit of cooling off time, then going back in to talk to them, you know, and, and uh, reasoning with them and talk and just talk out whatever was going on. So she would she put them in there. She said, so then I went back in to talk to her, and Brianna said, <laughs> Brianna's more like her dad. <laughs> and she says, and Brianna said, I'm resting right now. <laughs> Isn't that cute? <laughs> She had just done this, just done this, when I walked into the house. <laughs> so I was helping Nancy process this. <laughs> I said, okay. okay, okay, look, why don't you go sit down, watch some TV, <laughs> yeah, drink some coffee. No, not coffee. Drink, uh, drink, drink, have a glass of water, you know, <laughs> just sit down and rest for a little while. I'll take care of it, okay? So I went into Brianna and I said, Brianna, and I, I don't know what I said at that point. I'm sure I lectured her a little bit, and I probably swatted her on the bottom, too. You know, I, I probably, and then I said, and, and Nancy was going somewhere, so I said, you're going to stay here with me. You don't get to go. So that was just like, for her, that was just like, oh, no. You know, it's like the whole world had come to an end because there's always a party going on somewhere when you're a kid. You're convinced that any time you're isolated from that, that your parents have just gone to the best thing ever. You know, so I don't know where she went. She may have gone to the gas station to fill up the car with gas. It didn't matter what she was doing. Brianna was not going to go. And so she was convinced that that was the most fun in the universe that she was not going to get to. And so, so she was so mad at me, so angry then because she didn't get to go. And she said, Dad? I said, yeah, baby. And she says, I love Mom this much. And I said, yeah? She goes, I love you this much. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, I love you anyway. And then, uh, then, then she took a nap. <laughs> she took a nap. And then a little bit later, she got up, and we were watching Barney or whatever we were doing. And, uh, and she said, Dad? I said, yeah. She goes, uh, uh, and, and I, I don't know exactly. She says, I, I love... I, I, I love mom this much. I said, yeah. She goes, and I, I love you this much, too. <laughs> I said, thanks, baby. And she says, Dad? I said, yeah. She said, I'm never going to say I love you this much again. <laughs> and she never has. You know. But, you know, the funny thing was, at that point, when she's telling me, I love you this much, you know, um, I knew she was angry. I knew she was upset. I knew where her feelings had taken her at that particular moment. But I also knew that that was a little person that I would give my life for in a moment. Without any reservations, I knew that I loved her more than, than she could ever conceptualize. And that my love for her was not contingent upon her feelings at that particular moment. But that my love for her so far transcended that that she couldn't understand it because in truth I couldn't understand it myself. 
I can't even I can't even embrace how much I love my children. So for me to express it or expect them to have that identity would be impossible. So whether she feels like she loves me or not, it's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. It means nothing at all to me because I love them completely unconditionally. And when they don't feel like they're in that position, it does not matter. Not to me, but it does matter to them. It does matter to them because at that moment, even in spite of the fact that I love her more than life, she was in a place where she couldn't receive that. Do you follow that? God's love for us is so vast and so great and it never wavers. If you put yourself into hell, if you completely reject God and you make this world a living nightmare for yourself, God will still love you. If you reject everything about your life that He has designed for you, if you reject every premise that God has for you, it does not matter. He will still love you. But you will not be in a place where you can receive that love. You will not be in a condition to be receptive to what God has for you. And that's the tragedy that we seek to avoid. And that's the reason that we seek Him with our hearts. That's the reason that we can profess. Well, if we know that love, if we know that forgiveness, that God's blessings are ours, no, no, no good thing does He withhold from those whose walk is blameless. I want to give you a challenge, my friends, to a life of holiness today. I want to give you a challenge to seek the Lord with all your heart. To seek, to seek those things that have merit and worth. You know, I was thinking of New Year's resolutions this year. And uh, New Year's resolutions are always tough. Because New Year's resolutions are usually based on less. I'm going to eat less, drink less, smoke less. I don't know what you're going to do, but you're probably going to do less of it. That's your resolve, is to do less. But the truth of the matter is, we were designed for more. We were designed to have more of God's blessings, not less. The problem is, we keep asking for cereal instead of the good stuff. You know, I, I, I get hungry at night, I never go, wow, I really could go for some broccoli. <laughs> Within myself, man, it's Lay's potato chips and no one can eat just one. You're going to go for whatever sometimes is the worst. You know, in our natural state, who we are in ourselves, we do the same thing. You go, well, I can't rest. I'm, I can't go to sleep. I think I'll just sit down and pray or read the scripture for a while. Nah, you're going to go watch some stupid television show or get on the internet and look at something dumb. When there were so many more productive things. But if we do those things that God has called us to, you know, you can't take stuff out of your life that doesn't belong there. The stuff that doesn't belong in your life, and I, I, I love this illustration for all of us because you've all seen them. The stuff that doesn't belong in our lives are like goat heads. That's the evil stuff in our lives. They're like goat heads. They have a seven-year incubation period. You know, it's the funniest thing. I could take a tomato plant, plant it in my backyard, put, put fertilizer on it, water it every day, and it dies. I take a goat head. You lay that in the driveway. You pound on it with a hammer, you know, no, you, and then you burn it with a blowtorch, and it grows. <laughs> those things are horrible. They're horrible. I don't know why God made those. I tell you what, there's a question. But I know that how you get rid of them, the only thing you can do with a goat head to really get rid of them effectively, choke them out. Choke them out. You know what? The best thing we have in our, in our we could go through putting out pesticides, trying to kill them, a healthy lawn chokes out the goat heads. Do you follow that? In our lives, this year with your New Year's resolutions, I don't want you to have less. I want you to have more. More. More of everything. More of whatever it is. But pick the more that's the good stuff. Eat your cereal. But eat your broccoli first. Once you eat enough broccoli, you won't want the cereal. You, you follow that? Once, you, once you're reading the Bible and you're seeking God and you're really trying to, to get close to the Lord, you're not going to want those things that are a distraction to you. You're going to choke them out of your life because you're going to say, you know what, I, really, I can live without that. I can do without that thing that doesn't benefit me at all, especially when I've got something over here that's so much more beneficial, the things that I, that I enjoy so much more. 
So my challenge to you, my friends, today is to seek God's will, to seek, to seek, his, to seek his presence, you know, to seek his courts rather than these thousands elsewhere. Don't worry about the elsewhere. You just focus on the seeking his, his, his courts, his temple. Um, let's pray. Lord, we are your people, and this is your sanctuary. Set aside, dear Father, to worship and to praise you. I pray, dear Lord, that you would help us, God, to allow you, through the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit, to remove those things from our lives that don't need to be there. But God, I pray that you would help us to be conscientious of doing those things that benefit us the most spiritually and allow us to walk in harmony uh, and under your blessings with you. I thank you, Father, for your praises. I thank you, Lord, for your blessings. I thank you, dear God, for your grace and your mercy. And we praise you, Lord, for this day that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen.